Well, good morning, Vintage Grace Church. How are we doing this morning? Are we doing okay? Happy Valentine's Day. Um, if that's new to you, news, you can freely exit out the back. I won't be offended if you're just hearing that for the first time. Any men that need to leave um, right now. But happy Valentine's Day. Uh, my name is David Craw. I am a group's pastor here at Vintage Grace. And um, my wife and I and our three-year-old and one-year-old, we moved up about six months ago. And it has just been awesome um, to be a part of what God is doing here in our, our Vintage Grace community. Um, we have been in the book of John now for about six months. And really just looking at this beautiful text um, that the book of John is all about. It's all full of imagery from the Old Testament. You can't know the book of John uh, without knowing your Old Testament. And it's been full of um, revelation about who Jesus is. Really just asking this question of who is Jesus? That's the question John's asking and that's what he's revealing. Who is Jesus? And then really another question of how will you respond to Jesus? Who is Jesus and how will you respond to Jesus? And all the way throughout the book of John, we see um, that things are not as easy to understand as maybe they once appear. Sometimes in the book of John and even in our own lives, we might see something, but it's hard to see what's actually going on. I'm not sure if my clicker is here working. Zach, do I need to hit something? There it is. Okay. Um, you have to hit the button is what you have to hit. Um, <laughs> Sometimes things look one way, but they actually are very different. They might appear a certain way, but something else is actually going on. This picture, don't stare at it for too long, or you'll have to visit your eye doctor this week. It's not actually moving, but to our eyes, it looks like these lines are moving. Or maybe this one. How many feet are on the elephant? How many legs does the elephant have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, maybe? Four, five? I'm not really sure. Oh, what about this one? Don't stare at this one too long either. Are there black dots? Are there white dots? What's going on here? Okay, how about this one? How many of you see a duck? Any movie? How many of you see a rabbit? Okay, how many of you see the bear? That's in, oh, no, that's not in there. That's not actually there. <laughs> Depending on how you look at it, you see it in different ways. Ways. Okay, here's another one. If you stare at this picture for about 15 seconds, you might see a stormtrooper yeah. or you might see Jesus. Does anybody see Jesus? Start to see it? Okay, I've been staring at this picture all week and I still cannot see Jesus in the picture. I don't know what that says about like my spiritual state and soul. Okay, how many of you see Jesus in this picture? Stare at it. No, I'm just kidding. That's my son Jackson's just coloring <laughs> on a piece of paper. Okay, but here's the, here's the point. Sometimes things might appear one way, but it's hard to tell what's actually going on. Or we might see something, but not be able to actually see it. And that's what's happening in the book of John, and especially in our text this morning, is that the Jewish leaders and the Jewish people and the crowds and everyone, they're seeing Jesus, but they're not always understanding what's actually going on. They're seeing him, but they're not actually seeing him. I think that can happen in our lives too very often. This is my big idea for our text this morning. It's Jesus is the ultimate authority for our lives because he is sent directly from God the Father to us. And his words are God's words. Therefore, he invites us to see him truly by judging rightly and willingly laying down our way to walk in his way, which is a life full of abundant joy, rest, and peace found only in his kingdom, also known as the good life, which is what we've been studying in this passage, in this whole John series. So open up your Bibles. John 7 verses 14 through 15 is where we're going to be at this morning. John 7 verses 14 through 15, we'll read them together. It says, about the middle of the feast, Jesus went up into the temple and began teaching. The Jews therefore marveled, saying, how is it that this man has learning when he has never studied? So Jesus answered them, my teaching is not mine, but his who sent me. If anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether the teaching is from God or whether I'm speaking on my own authority. The one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory, but the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. And in him, there is no falsehood. Has not Moses given you the law, yet none of you keeps the law? Why are you seeking to kill me? The crowd answered, you have a demon. Who is seeking to kill you? Jesus answered them, I did one work and you all marvel at it. 
Moses gave you circumcision, not that it is from Moses, but from the fathers. And you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath, the man receives circumcision so that the law of Moses may not be broken, are you angry with me because on the Sabbath, I made a man's whole body well? Do not judge by appearances, but judge with a right judgment. Let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for your word this morning, God. We thank you that you are here in this room, God, that you reside in our hearts, that you are moving in our lives. And so, Father, I just ask that you would help us to pay attention to that this morning. That you would help us to pay attention to what you're doing, to how you are speaking to us, God, for what you are revealing to us, God. Give us eyes to see that, Lord. Speak to us to, through your text this morning, God. May we be attentive to it. May it dwell deeply in our hearts. We love you and pray this all in Christ's name. Amen. So where are we at in the book of John? Where are we at in the story? It's been about a couple of years now since John chapter five. That's kind of important to understand. A couple of years from John five to now get us to John seven, verses 14 through 24. And it's been about six months even just from John six. And so what is happening here is that John is picking out these kind of particular things, these particular pieces about Jesus' life, and he's putting them together to show us something very particular about Jesus. He's showing us these certain things because he wants us to understand some certain things about Christ, primarily who is Jesus and how will we respond to Jesus. And so during this time, Jesus has walked on water and he's fed the 5,000 and now he's in the middle of this festival. The festival of Sukkot, the festival of tabernacles, of booths, and many of you got to experience that here at VG. But if you did a little bit about this festival, it was kind of the highlight of the celebration, of their celebration, a highlight of the festivals that would happen throughout the Jewish calendar. And it really was to remind them of what God had done in delivering them from Egypt. It was a, a festival where there would be some confession at the beginning, but then they would really remember and they would celebrate how God had delivered them from Egypt. And so after a couple days of this festival, about the middle of the feast, Jesus stands up and he starts to teach. This might have been three days of silence. There might be some symbolism there where Jesus then stands up and now begins to teach. And so he stands up in this festival and he teaches them and they're just amazed at the way he teaches. They're in awe of his teaching and the Jewish leaders are kind of confused. They're like, how is this man teaching in this way? How, is this, how does this man have learning when he's never studied? See, for the Jewish rabbis, where you went to college, what name was on the front of your sweatshirt was a really big deal. They would have looked at Jesus and said, this man has never gone to our rabbinical schools. How is he teaching in this way? And where is he getting his authority from? The way the rabbis would teach is that they would always quote who they were teaching and who their teaching was based on. They would basically quote source after source after source after source. And so there would be the law and then there'd be all this rabbinical teaching wrapped up around it. That's they would quote one rabbi who quotes another rabbi who quotes a rabbi. But Jesus doesn't teach that way, does he? If you remember the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus stands up and says, it is written or you've heard it said, but I say to you this. See, Jesus is teaching with this completely different authority that he brings to the table. And they're like, how does this man have learning when he's never studied? And it's easy for us to kind of judge the Jewish leaders. It's easy for us to kind of look at them and say, come on guys, Jesus, right? He's right there. Don't you see what he's doing? Look, Jesus is right there, he's teaching, except his teaching. But imagine this. Imagine at Vintage Grace, one of our junior hires, you know, that we had known for years, high school. Maybe this person's a young adult now. They come into this room and, you know, and they say, you know, Drew says this. And the Bible says this, but I tell you this. That wouldn't really fly, would it? We'd have a major problem on our hands. This is what this is like for them. Jesus, so like, we know Jesus. You come from nowhere, Palestine. We know your family. Now you're standing up and you're teaching and you've never gone to school. Who are you, Jesus? And this, so they're confused. They're confused by his teaching. And Jesus responds to him and says this, my teaching is not mine. My teaching is not mine. It comes from him who sent me that Jesus is sent to us and it comes directly from his father. And he says this, he says, if anyone's will is to do God's will, he will know whether my teaching is from God or whether I speak on my own authority. See, Jesus says, yeah, you don't know who I am or why I have this teaching. I never studied at Rabbi University, but if you were seeking God's will, you would know whether my teaching is from God 
or not. See, Jesus is getting to the heart of their problem very quickly. Isn't that what Jesus always does? We want to make excuses about why we're not doing this or what is happening here, our rationalizations, and Jesus gets to their heart immediately. And he says, no, the problem's not my credentials. The problem is that you have in mind your own will, your own plans for me, not God's plan and not his will. You have in mind what you want from me, what you want from Jesus, not what Jesus has to come and what he's offering them. They don't have a theology problem. They have a heart problem right here. A heart that doesn't want to surrender to God's will. And this is crazy that they're in the middle of a festival reminding them how God delivered them from Egypt. They're in the middle of this festival remembering how God showed up in a way that surprised them how he delivered them, but also how they didn't obey God. How they made an idol and how they worshiped an idol while Moses was getting the 10 commandments. And it was this moment of remembering and lamenting while also remembering God's deliverance. And in the same moment that they're celebrating that festival, they're just doing what they had done hundreds of years before. They missed God when they were being delivered from Egypt and here they were and God was right in front of them and they were missing God. Again, they're missing what's right in front of them. I have to tell a Valentine's Day story because it's Valentine's Day. My wife and I, we were 19. We were dating at the time and we were, I think, sophomores in college. And we'd only been dating for like a couple of months, okay? We'd only been dating for a couple of months and, you know, I was trying to be like a good boyfriend. I think I was like 19 years old. And my wife was kind of talking about, you know, I kind of want to get like a fashion ring. I had kind of heard her say sometime we're dating. And I was like, oh, you know, I'll be a good boyfriend. I'll buy her a ring on Valentine's Day, just like a fashion ring. She'll like this. You know, she'll be, I'll be like, sweet. I'll score some points as, as a boyfriend. And so we went out. It was Valentine's Day. We went and had this nice dinner. And we're down in LA. And we're like, hey, let's go for a walk on the beach. So we're walking on the beach and it's sunset and it's Valentine's Day and we just had this nice dinner and I have a ring in my pocket. And we're walking and we've been dating for about three months now and I'm like, hey babe, I've, I've got this gift I wanna give to you. So I pull out this ring box and she's like, this is not happening right now. We have only been dating for three months. I'm like, what? I just, I just wanna give you a gift and I had missed all the signs that were right in front of me of what this was gonna look like had completely flown over my head. Just completely missed it. Who has a, you've missed it story. And so the same thing's happening to them. There's all these signs. There's all these ways that Jesus is revealing himself. There's all these ways that he's moving. There's all these ways that he's working, but they're still missing it. And Jesus says, look, it's not about the signs that you're missing ultimately. It's not because there's not enough evidence. It's not because I don't have the right credentials. I didn't go to the right school. It's because your will is set on what you want. Isn't that happen in our lives a lot? We miss what God is doing because our will is set on what we want, not what God wants. And Jesus is saying, look, if you surrender your will to me, if you surrender what you want, if you lay that down before me, you won't miss what I'm doing in the moment. Surrender your will before me. And there's a temptation here in our life. There's a temptation to live willfully, where we come to God and we say, God, here's my plan. Two and a half kids, one and a half dogs, one and a half houses. Here's my plan of what I want you to do for my life. Here's my three to five year plan. Here's the promotion that I want, the job that I want, the life that I want. And we can kind of go and try and make that happen on our own life and our own strength. Anybody else struggle with that? Am I the only one? We can start to live really willfully in our lives. And before we know it, suddenly we're not pursuing God's will for our life. Suddenly we're pursuing our will for our life. Suddenly it's not really about what God wants or what he has for us. It's about what we want what we have for our lives. And God's saying, look, you're living really willfully. You're coming to me with your plans. You want to make me king politically. You want more bread that I fed you. This is your plan, but I have a different plan. And so sometimes we can start to live really willfully. We can start to miss God's will and his plan because we're pursuing our will and our plan. That's on one end of the spectrum. But the other end of the spectrum maybe is living willlessly. Maybe some of you are experiencing this in COVID. You just feel defeated in life right now. There's just despair that you're feeling and you're kind of like, well, I guess what's the point of trying anymore? And you're on the other side of the spectrum and that's not good either. And Jesus says, what would it be like to not live willfully or willlessly, but what would it look like to be willing? What would it look like just every morning to wake up and to lay down your will before God the Father? 
to say, God, here's my will. Here's my plan. Here's what I want. The kids or the dog or the house or the job or the family. My plans for this day, for this year. God, I just lay that down before you. Just to surrender that to God every single day. To say, God, willingly, what do you have for me today? How would that change your week? How would that change the way you live moment to moment? Just to live willingly to saying, God, what do you have for me? I surrender that to you. Oswald Chambers says this. Did I miss that? He said, no one is ever united with Jesus Christ until they are willing to relinquish not only sin, but their whole way of looking at things. Isn't that good? No one is ever united with Jesus Christ until they are willing to relinquish not only sin, but their whole way of looking at things. And that's what Jesus is saying. He's saying, come, lay down your will. Lay down your will before me. Surrender this to me. But there's so many things that get in the way of that, right? So many distractions. So many ways I want to be in control every single day because every single day there's a battle in your heart between trust and control. Every single day. Will today you walk trusting in God? Will you walk surrendering to God? Will you walk with your hands open, releasing that to him, saying, God, not my will, but your will be done? Or will you fight for control? Right now in this moment, there's a battle going on in my own heart for that. I want this sermon to go well. I want you to be impacted by something that you hear this morning from the text and God, how he speaks to you. And there's an invitation that God is saying, come, just lay that down before me, David. Surrender that to me, trust or control every single day. And so we have to train our hearts. We have to train our hearts to surrender before God the Father, to surrender that to him. Richard Foster says this, we must begin to enter into a grace-filled releasing of our will and flowing into the will of the Father. It is the prayer of relinquishment, a prayer of surrender that moves us from struggling to releasing. This prayer is a bona fide letting go, but it is a release with hope. God is not destroying the will, but transforming it so that we can freely will what God wills. You know, sometimes we think God just wants to destroy us. That he just wants us to kind of bulldoze our lives so that we kind of become this empty person with really kind of no wants or life or loves or anything. That's not what God's doing at all. He wants to take your will and he wants to transform it. So you say, gosh, I love my kids so much, but God, here are my kids. I love this job. God, here's this job. I love living in EDH or Folsom or Placerville, wherever you live, but God, I lay that down before you. And this is so important to happen in the church too, because we come to God and we have all of our own plans and God's saying, lay that down before me. Practice surrendering every single day to me. What would it look like just to pray this prayer every single morning? God, I surrender to you my hopes, my dreams, my ambitions. Do with them what you will, when you will, as you will. What would it look like just to pray that to God every single day? I try to pray something like this in the shower every single morning. That's where I do most of my prayer time. Saying, God, okay, here's the day. Here's that meeting. Here's this person. Here's this event. Here's this sermon, God. I give this to you. God, what do you want today? I lay this down before you. My hopes, my dreams, my ambitions. Do what you want with them. When you want, when you want to do with them. What you will. Because otherwise, our will is going to take us away from what God wants to do. We have to train ourselves to be surrendered to God or else we miss what God is doing right in front of us. And so Jesus keeps going. And he says, the one who speaks on his own authority seeks his own glory. But the one who seeks the glory of him who sent him is true. In him, there is no falsehood. See, Jesus says, you're missing me. You're seeing, but you're not really seeing because of your will, but also it's because you're pursuing your own glory. It's because you're pursuing your own fame. And this is so easy to do in our day and world today, isn't it? We live in this hyper digital world that's full of Instagram where we want to put our best foot forward and we want people to look and think a certain thing about us. It doesn't matter if your life is falling apart as long as it looks good on Instagram. And we can be consumed with the appearance of things, consumed with the glory of our own fame, our own lives, building kind of our own kingdom. Gosh, I face this temptation every single day in the church. The church can be of America, can be the worst place for this. 
Go, become a big deal. Celebrity Christians, celebrity culture that's infused into the church. And Jesus says, no, there's a different way. There's a different way than that. It's a downward mobility. It looks like laying down your will. It looks like laying down your preferences, laying down what you want, not pursuing your own glory, but pursuing the glory of God. And Jesus says, when you do that, the person that does that, I'm doing that. He's modeling that to us. In him, there's nothing false. But there's a little bit of death in that, isn't there? A little bit of death to our will, a little bit of death to our own glory and fame, death to building our own kingdom. And Jesus is saying, come, die to those things. I have a better way for you. I have an abundant life for you. Come, lay down your will before me. Come, lay down your own glory. Give those things up for, to me. Because the glory that we seek, this reveals what's on the throne of our heart. Is it ourselves or is it Jesus? Are we sitting on the throne of our heart or is he actually sitting on the throne of our heart? So how do we actually pursue the glory of God? How do we actually lay down our will? How do we actually pursue? What does Jesus have for us? What makes him look greater? I think it looks like pursuing really small things in your life. I feel like God's been inviting me just the last six months to continue just to die to myself. What does it look like to care about small things in the kingdom? Things that maybe people will never see or hear about, things that you never take a picture of and put it on Instagram. I'm really good at doing this in my marriage. I'll do the dishes, but I'll make sure my wife Kelsey knows that I did the dishes. I'll clean out the closet, but I'll be like, hey, babe, I cleaned out the closet there. Spent two hours on that. But what does it look like just to be faithful in really, really small things? To be the spouse or boyfriend, girlfriend, or being called by God, the mission he's given you, just to be, do that faithfully without seeking glory from other people. To be the parent, the mom or the dad that God's calling you to be and just faithfully showing up and doing that. To be faithfully pursuing what God has for you, small things every single day that look small in our world, but actually really big in the kingdom. The values of the kingdom are so upside down. Valuing and pursuing what God has for us, small ways. Dying to ourselves, being faithful in the small things. And the crazy thing about this is this is the path of freedom for us as followers of Jesus. When you're chasing your own will, you're a slave to it. When you're chasing your own glory or fame, you're a slave to your ego. And so the death of that, your will being transformed into the will of Jesus is the path of freedom. So you wake up every day and say, God, this is about your will, not what I want. God, this is about your glory, not my own glory. Suddenly you enter into freedom. You're no longer a slave to your ego. You no longer have to have life on your terms. Those people are the most trapped people in the world that have to have life their way. And Jesus is saying to the Jewish leaders, you're missing me because you're set on your will and because you're pursuing your own glory. And they respond to Jesus. They say, the crowd responds. They say, Jesus, you're crazy. You have a demon. Who's seeking to kill you? Don't we do this all the time too? Not only do I disagree with you, but you're evil. <laughs> Not only do I disagree with you, but yeah, Satan is at work in what you're doing. Not me, but in there. And they're missing what he's doing. And so they're saying, Jesus, you're crazy. You have a demon. This isn't from God. And they're missing what he's doing, it's right in front of them and they're missing it. And they're like, who's trying to kill you, Jesus? And we'll see all throughout the next chapter how they're continually trying to kill Jesus, the Jewish leaders. Because not only was Jesus offending the way they thought things were, but we have to read this passage and see how there's money at play here. There's power at play here. There's status at play here in this passage because the Jewish leaders, they're concerned with circumcision and Sabbath, and they're concerned with the law of Moses because those are all the things that gave them status in their religious society. That, that was their way of life. And Jesus is offending that. And I think he's saying to us, hey, look, I want to come and I want to offend your way of life. I want to come and I want to flip your life upside down. It's going to begin to look different and all the small things and all the old things that you used to hold on to. I want you to do those in a new way, not your way, but my way. 
Jesus responds to their accusations and he says, I did one work. And you all marvel at it. Jesus here is referring back to John chapter five where he healed the man who was paralyzed at the pool. And so John here is painting this picture, showing us this. Jesus is referring back to this. And if you remember that, John five, Jesus heals the paralyzed man and they're all upset because he did it on the Sabbath. And Jesus says, I did one work, you all marvel at it. But Moses gave you circumcision and you circumcise a man on the Sabbath. If on the Sabbath a man receives circumcision, so the law of Moses may not be broken. Are you angry with me because on the Sabbath I made a man's whole body well? Jesus is saying, look, you have this conundrum that's before you and I'm calling you out on it. He's calling them out on their hypocrisy. Basically what they were struggling with is they've said, okay, if a child is born and we're supposed to circumcise them on the Sabbath, is it better to break the law and circumcise them or break the law and not circumcise them? So they were stuck. And so what they would do is they would circumcise the boy and say, well, okay, the spirit of the law allows for this. And Jesus is saying, you're already paying attention to the spirit of law there, but then when I heal a man's whole body on the Sabbath, why are you so upset? He's calling him out here. He's calling him out because he says, here I am before you. I'm doing these signs and I'm revealing to you who I am. And I healed a person, their whole body on the Sabbath. And you're upset about that because you're concerned about something else rather than what God has for them. Because the Sabbath, the circumcision, the law, that was all about their pride primarily. It was all about their identity. It was the way the Jews would distinguish themselves from other nations by saying, hey, look, we circumcise, so we're like not like those pagan nations. We follow the Sabbath, so we're not like those pagan nations. And guess what? We've got Moses. You hear about Moses in all these chapters because he was kind of their George Washington. He was kind of their trump card that they would say, hey, look, we've got him in our back pocket. It was not a Trump reference, FYI. No emails on that statement, okay? He was in their back pocket. He was their aces in the pocket. Whatever you want to say. It was like, we've got Moses, okay? We've got Moses, and so we're good, Jesus. And Jesus is saying, no, you're not. That's what you've built your identity on. That's what you're trying to claim for your authority, and I'm here to offend that. That's what you're trying to claim as your identity that's distracting you from me. That's what you're holding so tightly onto, and you're missing what I'm doing. And friends, Jesus is saying the exact same thing to us this morning, that we can be seeing it, but not seeing it that we can live our life chasing often really good things, but we might actually be missing what God is doing right in front of us. And so where is that for you this morning in your life? Where is God working? Where is he moving in your life, in your relationships, in your family, in your work? And are you seeing him moving in that place? Are you distracted by other things? Are you coming to him with saying, God, I've got my plan. I've got my will. God, I'm pursuing my own glory. I've got my own fame. Is this gonna work? Are we both gonna line up here or not? Jesus comes and he invites us to die to ourselves, to lay down our will, to lay down our glory, ultimately to lay down our pride that we're holding on to. Drew recently just gave our whole staff this book, Humility by Andrew Murray. I think actually he gave it to me and then he decided to give it to the whole staff. It's like, this guy really needs this. <laughs> How awesome is it that we have a pastor who's that humble, okay, to give us that book? And so he says in this book, Andrew Murray, he says, nothing of heaven can live in you until pride dies in you. Isn't that good? Nothing of heaven can live in you until pride dies in you because it ultimately comes down to this question. Who's Lord? Who's God? Who sits on the throne of your heart and until heaven can live in us, until we can see his work and his kingdom on the move, our pride has to die. Our pride has to die. We have to lay down our life and surrender our life to Jesus and lay down what we want for what he has for us. I think the kingdom is really small in our lives. The kingdom's full of diaper changes. And the kingdom's full of being a carpool parent driving your kids around. The kingdom's full of caring for aging, aging parents, faithfully loving them. The kingdom is full of being faithful in, to God in your business and not cutting corners, not because nobody will catch you, but just for the sake of being faithful. The kingdom is full of these things that our world doesn't value, but God says that's valuable. Don't judge by mere appearances. Don't judge by the way things look. Make a right judgment. See the kingdom. 
See the kingdom of God at work and what he is actually doing every moment and every day. Because here's the thing, Jesus has gone before us. He's sent from God. He's already gone ahead of us. Now his spirit is on the move. He's working your life in big ways. If we'll have eyes just to see what he is doing. So how do we actually do this? How do we actually do this? How do we actually wake up every day and not miss Jesus? Not miss maybe what he's trying to do in our lives. I think the first thing is just to live surrendered. How do you live surrendered? How do you wake up every day and lay down God? Not my will, but what is your will? Are you with me? What's your will, Jesus? What do you have for me today? How do I just surrender that to you? That's where the battle is going to start. The battle between trust and control every single day in your life. Just to live surrendered to God. And then what does it look like just to live in the kingdom? To be faithful to just the few things that God has called you to be faithful to. Small things that are actually really big in the kingdom. Just living for those things. Caring about those things. Those are going to be the non-impressive things. But the things that you can actually just live in in the kingdom, the things that matter in the kingdom. And then what is it like just to live sent? That Jesus came, this is that R3 relationship, that Jesus came, that he was sent from God. His authority comes not from himself, and his authority comes from God, so we surrender to that authority every day. Then to live on mission, to say, God, you are moving, you are working, what are you doing? in my Pray Watch community? What are you doing in my neighborhood? What are you doing in my family, in my relationships? How do I just live surrendered to that and live on mission for the ways God is already working in your life? Jesus, he's the ultimate authority for our lives because he is sent directly from God. He's sent directly from God to us. And he invites us willingly, lay down our lives. Lay down our will, our way, our way of doing things, and then freely enter into the abundant life that's in Christ. The joy and rest and peace that comes from laying that down. There's no other place that we find rest, that we find joy, that we find peace, but from surrendering our will to God's will and what he has for us. Will you pray with me? Let's just take a minute and think about those questions. Where is God already at work in your life? Where is he already moving? Just think about that question right now. Maybe just talk with God about that. God, where are you working in my life? And then maybe just ask the question, God, what is blinding me from seeing how you are working. What is blinding me from seeing, God, how you're working that might be right in front of me? And just talk with God about that for a minute. We just want to have some time to do business with God here. God, we thank you that you are moving, that you are working in our lives, that we can live in the kingdom here in this moment, every single day. And so Jesus, I pray that we would have eyes to actually see that. You would help us to daily, willingly lay down our lives, our heart, our plan for your kingdom. To lay down what we want for what you would have for us, God. So that we would see truly, that we would judge rightly and see how you are moving, how you are working. And we'd surrender fully 
to your lordship in our lives. That we would joyfully live an abundant life in you, Jesus. We love you and pray this all in Christ's name. Amen.